this is the last event of the Barbara Jordan National Forum, the 25th year. Uh, the Barbara Jordan National Forum is a way to celebrate the legacy of Professor Barbara Jordan, who uh, was a professor at the LBJ School for a long time and an esteemed uh, congressperson from the state of Texas. Um, this is the last event of the forum, uh, and we're really, uh, it's a, a tough couple tough acts to follow. You know, we've had uh, Mayor Sylvester Turner, uh, Dr. Burnett at Houston Tillotson, um, but I, I'm really excited to put this exclamation point on the end of a, a great set of events. Uh, before I discuss the event today, I, I just want to give some thank yous. Specifically, I uh, would love to thank the Barbara Jordan National Forum co-chairs, Brianna McBride, Zoe Parker, and Kuro Tawil for their excellent work. Also want to give thanks to the uh, newly founded JEDI office uh, with Director Esteban Delgado and Dr. Uh, I mean, Dean uh, Peniel Joseph, uh, who've offered their full support behind uh, all of these events. Uh, also, thank you to Emily Dunkley at the uh, Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and to the LBJ communications team, uh, Tori Yu, Alyssa Vidalis, and Christian Aguirre uh, for making this month possible. Um, this event is hosted by the newly founded Latinx student group at LBJ, Students Unidos. Um, we formed this group this year because we wanted to make sure that Latinx students at the school had a voice and uh, seat at the table uh, when student life was occurring, when decisions with the administration were occurring. And so when we decided to put together a proposal for this event, we wanted to be talking to folks who were working at that intersection, who are giving community members and uh, members of historically underrepresented groups a voice. Um, equity officers do this every day, and we're going to get to hear them talk about their work, how the history of this country and of Austin informs their work, how anchor institutions like the city, like the school district, like the university work together, um, and ultimately how they achieve their mission of elevating community voices. And to lead that discussion today is Dr. Ted Gordon. Uh, Dr. Gordon has been an incredibly important leader at this institution. He served as the founding chair of the African and African, African Diaspora Studies Department and today serves as the vice provost for diversity in the tower. And he's still inspiring students today. Uh, many of us first years were lucky enough to hear him speak at our orientation. Um, and even the year before that, I've heard the second year students talk about a wonderful talk he gave uh, about competing histories as uh, represented by public art on campus. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. I'll turn it over to you to get us started and invite our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Students Unidos, it sounds like a, a positive group and thank you for considering having me come and participate in this. It's also a shout out to Brianna McBride, an old friend. Uh, if you're out there, Brianna, nice to be here with you. Uh, I'm supposed to introduce myself, but David really said all there is to say. Um, I've been here a long time at the University of Texas at Austin, and I've seen a lot of stuff. Uh, and in as much as the University of Texas is an anchor institution in terms of uh, equity in the city, uh, the University of Texas has had a very checkered past in relation to that, but we'll get into that as we move forward. Uh, I am joined by two extremely uh, bright, um, I don't call them stars, but bright lights on the scene here uh, in Austin in relationship to equity. And I will call on Brian Oaks to introduce himself, one of our panelists. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Oaks, the Chief Equity Officer at the City of Austin. And uh, I take on the responsibility of really trying to provide leadership and guidance and, uh, and insight on all matters of racial equity across everything that we do as um, a city. And uh, prior to coming to the city, I served uh, for 17 years at the American Heart Association as the Vice President of Health Equity. And I got into this work 
um, because I lost a father that uh, died at a really young age uh, from congestive heart failure. I grew up in a neighborhood called South Park in Southeast Houston. And um, we were the neighborhood that, you know, um, we talk about neighborhoods in, in sort of um, these sort of data formats of like low socioeconomic status and all the different terminologies that, you know, that we use. And uh, I grew up in that neighborhood. I lived in that neighborhood um, called South Park and um, didn't really sort of question why my dad had a premature um, death in his life until after that. And it really sent me on a personal journey to start to learn more uh, about how we design and build cities and neighborhoods, um, the connection to institutional racism, to how it impacts that design. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, uh, but it ends up in a lower quality of life uh, and it ends up in a shorter lifespan uh, for black and brown people uh, in America. And what I saw in Houston is it's exported across the entire country. We sort of see the same design and we see that same design in Austin too. So I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I know that I'm in sort of great company uh, with some esteemed colleagues and just looking forward to the conversation for today. Good afternoon, I'm Stephanie Hawley, the equity officer for Austin Independent School District. And uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I uh, am just really honored to have this conversation with you all today. Um, just great company and looking forward to the conversation. Always learn from these. Um, but I've been in education a little over 30 years in some capacity, either K through 12, and spent about the last 10 years before I arrived at AISD two years ago at Austin uh, Community College as the Associate Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. And like Brian, um, we all have stories, I think. And, you know, my story is, um, is one of being a military child and one who didn't have a lot of connections to my culture and my history as my father traveled around in the Air Force. Um, education seemed to be the, the space and the place where I, I often saw the divides and I saw who could and who couldn't because of structures. And I ran from the work of equity and inclusion for many years. I was an English teacher. I was a, a vice president of academic affairs at um, Malcolm X College. But I always ran from the, uh, the, the work of trying to transform institutions because I felt like uh, offices of equity often get marginalized, um, uh, decentered, and used for diversity window dressing. Uh, but over the years at Austin Community College, I pretty much got dragged in and could no longer look away from the inequities and the structures that were creating inequities. And then two years ago, when I heard that AISD was looking for an inaugural equity officer, um, I was drawn to this position and uh, it's been quite an education over the last two years and hope today to get a chance to talk with you all about the education of Stephanie Hawley at Austin ISD. Uh, it's been quite a journey. And uh, I said earlier before we came on that I wanted to thank Dr. Gordon because Dr. Gordon really paved the way and, and, and broke some of the, the hard ground that's necessary uh, for us to be able to do our work in the Office of Equity here at AISD. So looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you both for those uh, introductions. Uh, Let's get right to it. So the first question, this is supposed to be, well, the, the uh, title of what we're doing here is Realizing Equity in Austin, the Role of Anchor Institutions. So I wanna start out by focusing in on these two anchor institutions, the city government and the, actually the uh, K through 12 government uh, uh, and administration and try to sort of figure out what it is that equity looks like from the perspective of your institution. So what, what were you hired to do as equity officers? What, you know, what, what's the goal? Uh, what's the institutional goal of the city? What's the institutional goal of AISD in relationship to equity? And either one of you could start out. 
Stephanie, you want to start or you want me to start? You're always directing me, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can start. I can start. One of the reasons, uh, one of the, the things that uh, drew me to this position was that there did not appear to be goals for equity when I got here. So I'm just going to be abundantly clear. Um, you heard me say earlier that I've always avoided this work. And a lot of times people like to have equity offices for what I call diversity window dressing in order to say that there's an attempt or there, there's a, it's performative. And so I was drawn to this because there were no necessarily set goals. And so that meant that I could build it. And one of the things that we come to do, I was an office of one for about six months, a little bit longer than that, actually. But um, I was able to talk with the previous superintendent and tell him that, this. first of all, it couldn't be an equity officer. Um, that was the first challenge I had when I came on board was everybody said, we need, I said, this is not about um, being a sheriff and saying equity, not equity, um, but it was about building the capacity of the organization to do equity and to look at who is it that's been marginalized or decentralized in the system over decades and decades. And then how do we help the leadership, first of all, build the capacity to start to make different decisions and to engage people that we've marginalized over decades in different ways. And so the goal for the office uh, was wrapped around building capacity, changing the thinking and understanding the history of the district, because we worked with a lot of leaders who had no idea the damage and the violence done to black and brown students. And so I define the mission as one of capacity building because I know that I can't change student outcomes because I don't teach a single student in this district, right? But uh, the office does have the capacity to uh, teach, and, and that terrible word, right? To, to teach about critical race functions in, in the organization, right? Um, to do professional learning, those kinds of things. So we set up the goal of looking at capacity building and touching every department in central office that has an impact on the campus. And uh, Dr. Gordon, I don't know if I answered your question or if that was a lot of education needs, uh, but it's about capacity building for our office. I think that's a good start. Let's see what the city's doing. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, similar origins. You know, we, uh, our equity office was established back in 2016. And uh, it came on the tails of, um, you know, the city sort of changing from uh, at-large council uh, to the new 10-1 council. So we had district level re representation uh, as a city for the first time. And uh, during that year, 2015, um, I think it's the, the, I, I say it's the juxtaposition of Austin, the things that we struggled with was that Austin was named uh, the most family-friendly city in the United States, um, but at the same time was also the most economically segregated city in the United States, right? And so it also sort of pushes you to sort of ask, uh, what value do we place on the best of or the best places to live in America when you have such huge uh, sort of disparities? And, and I say that in that report, uh, that was done on economic segregation, they were being nice to us because what they didn't do was to go the next step was to say, it's not just geographically segregated by income, it's racially segregated, you know, by, by income. Um, but we had a group of community-based organizations that had formed a, a coalition uh, back in 2015 called Communities of Color United. And I would say that they were just fed up, you know, like, we tired of this of, of, of these sort of two Austins uh, and, and frustrated, and they were able to actually get uh, the council to pass this resolution, which called on the city manager to um, develop and create an equity assessment tool. Uh, they talked about wanting to sort of make decisions better through equity lens. Uh, also, in our budgeting process, uh, you know, was part of that resolution. And really, I think at that time, the city leadership had not really had a lot of exposure 
uh, to this work around racial equity, especially in government at the time. And they were able uh, to connect with some uh, folks that work for a national organization called Government Alliance for Race and Equity. Uh, we call them GAIR. Uh, and eventually kind of helped lead them down a road that um, they needed to establish an, an office uh, to really be able to sort of hold this work um, and to focus on this work. And then I came on board uh, back in 2016 as the city's first chief equity officer. And, and just very similar to, to Dr. Holly uh, in that our work is really sort of centered in these three areas. I think behind everything that we do, uh, we are taking on this very ambitious goal of trying to um, hopefully sort of push our city to, to, to be an anti-racist multicultural institution and to have a culture um, that reflects that in everything that we do and the way that we function. And, and we think a lot of our work centers around how we change culture, because if we can change culture, uh, we change the way we do our work. We change the type of decisions that we make. Uh, we lead more with our heart and have empathy for vulnerable folks in our community. Uh, we're more in touch with uh, the, the choices that we decide. Uh, we think better about how we prioritize certain projects over the others. You think about all of the functions that uh, a city does. Uh, it improves if we have the right uh, culture behind all of that. Uh, we do that through uh, focusing on three things. Um, one for us is that we really sort of place an emphasis on developing uh, our people uh, to really sort of have, uh, we say normalize or develop a shared understanding around uh, basic principles of racial equity uh, and how we sort of move people along and develop people to have a better analysis or a lens to see how this plays out in the work that, we, that they do. Uh, we also focus a lot of time on the importance of uh, organizing. So to Dr. Holly's point, like this is not work that is done in isolation. Uh, it needs to really be done with coalition. And, um, but there's work to be done to help organize people and to, and to sort of build infrastructure to be able to support the work and be able to support change. Uh, and then we also uh, place a lot of emphasis on uh, operationalizing around racial equity. So how do we introduce this uh, into the sort of functions and the process of the institution? And we can talk more about that, but we spend a lot of time around uh, assessments and, and tools and uh, how do you sort of disrupt some of the processes within the institution to get different results, better results. And that's a big part of the work too. So following up on um, what both of you just said, um, what are, for your institutions, what are the most important indicators of inequity? In other words, you've been hired as equity officers. That implies that there's some inequity uh, involved. Lots of times we're not very specific about what that is. So in AISD and for the city of Austin, what are the most important indicators of inequity that you're grappling with? Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's a long list, but I, I would start first with uh, just with student achievement. I can predict who's been prepared to pass the state mandated um, standardized test. I can predict uh, when I first came to the district, I put on tennis shoes and blue jeans and went to various campuses where people didn't know what I was the equity of, they didn't know me. Um, my reception to different campuses was very interesting um, until people found out who I was, right? So the indicators on how I was welcomed at different campuses was a red flag for me. But when I look at student achievement data, who can read by third grade, I can predict who will not be able to read by third grade. Um, I played a little game with myself when I was in office of one, I would go into a school and see if I could predict who was going to be in um, in school suspension and who was going to be in gifted and talented programs. Um, and I was always on the money. I mean, it was, I could predict black and brown children were disproportionately represented in discipline and punishment. 
Um, and right now our office has a, a, a multi-year project we're working on with the community to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. And we've done it by bringing together uh, internal staff who have the most influence over these processes and with community members, families. Uh, we've got every abuelas, grandmas, uh, folks that come together monthly, not to just stare at the data and say, isn't it awful, but to actually start talking about what needs to be different. And, and in less than a year, we've been able to get human capital to actually launch programs to uh, ensure that we've got more black and brown teachers. Uh, we're, we're doing active recruiting at uh, predominantly black and Hispanic uh, uh, universities. But you ask, what are those indicators? When I can predict who can read and who can't read, I was in a school several weeks ago talking to a young black man, and I say young black men because we tend to call black boys males. Um, interesting, language also tells me something, but I, I, <laughs> I'll stay with where I'm going here. When I can go into schools and black boys in fourth and fifth grade cannot read, um, the, it, it's very telling. And so you know you've got structural racism when there's predictability and, and who is uh, well served. And you know here in the organization we also talk about people have gotten language about marginalized. Now I, I consider I continue to try to support our organization in changing language. Marginalized is not an adjective. It is a verb. It is what dominant culture does to black and brown children and to children identified as low income. So some of the inequities we see begin in our mouth and in, in our mindsets, but those things around achievement, discipline and punishment are, will make you cry when you look at the data. Um, and those, those are the things that get me up every morning um, organizing as, as Brian said, organizing to get other people to see what sometimes they can't see, but it's in the quantitative data and it's also uh, in the stories of abuelas, of grandmothers, aunts, ministers. Uh, people have told us all over East Austin. Um, when I first came, we put together an equity action plan and it was kind of a on the fly data collection of just, I talked to over 1500 people inside and outside of the organization so they could tell me what the inequities were. And all of them were around achievement, discipline, and punishment, and in hospitality, at their in their uh, in their schools. You know, consequently, we've lost a lot of black and brown students to charter schools because charter schools have been able to provide a welcome and a respect that uh, our families, black and brown families, told us they were not being provided, so they left. Uh, so those indicators, that whole piece about being well, feeling welcome and connected, academic achievement, discipline, and punishment, those are, those are the, the red flags here at AIPD. Yeah, we have a lot of red flags <laughs> at the city level, right? Um, our city is, is, is guided by what we call strategic direction. And so uh, we have these five outcome areas uh, that we look at it as a city and all the work that, that we do are kind of really sort of geared uh, towards trying to have impact in those outcome areas. Uh, the first year that we actually established the equity office, we worked a lot with community to define uh, what equity would actually mean for the city because, you know, imagine trying to solve or tackle something um, that if you sort of pull everybody who's sitting at the table, they have a different understanding of what it is. And um, from that first year of the work that we did around it, we actually came up with a really kind of, I, I, I sort of say very powerful and simple definition, which is, uh, you know, racial equity is in Austin where race no longer predicts uh, quality of life outcomes. And so for us, the, the metric is really around every quality of life indicator that we track as a city um, we don't have equity until um, race no longer predicts who's at the top or who's at the bottom but unfortunately across many of those quality of life indicators um, race has everything to do with who's at the top and who's at the bottom and that's probably like you know um, 
I would sort of say the, the first sort of big battle we had uh, with an equity office at the city of Austin because people wanted to make, um, you know, um, the work about a lot of different other identities, which we acknowledge that there's an intersection there, but we were really sort of focused on leading uh, with race as the primary predictor because it predicts so much of the outcomes across all of the indicators, right? Um, you cannot not sort of focus on race and have any impact in this in this area uh, if you don't, right? And so we were really sort of focused on that. But if I had to sort of pull out like all the things that we track as a city and from all of the conversations uh, that I've had over, over the years with community, uh, I would say, um, and, and this is sort of how our work is really connected with each other. Uh, so Dr. Holly and I, um, one of the areas is um, displacement and uh, intentionally the loss of the Black community in Austin uh, and the gentrification and the displacement that we've sort of seen in our Eastern Crescent, uh, which is connected to issues of affordability, um, but also connected to issues of quality of schools. So uh, when you look at Dr. Eric Tang's research around uh, why Black people, uh, even the city, number one was affordability, but number two was the quality of the schools. They were leaving to go look for better schools or, and better uh, districts or leaving to go look for more affordable um, housing, right? And so I think about uh, the work that we do as a city and the role that we play, we have a heavy footprint uh, you know, in that. And I think we have a lot of lessons learned around uh, some of the areas that we developed um, where we did not uh, really center racial equity in the development or really centered the people in that development. And we actually, in, in, in a lot of cases, we did more harm than good under the guise of things that were supposed to be good for uh, the community. So that's the stuff that we have to unpack. Um, I also think about uh, issues around like health and wellness uh, in our community and the indicators around uh, chronic disease, uh, access to health. Um, and we saw that play out with COVID numbers. I think that when the pandemic started, we were really having an aggressive push for the need for us to make sure that we had data by race and ethnicity on, uh, on testing for COVID because we knew based upon all the history and all the things that we saw in other indicators prior to the pandemic, that we would see a disproportionate impact in that. And uh, so much of our COVID response as a city and a county really driven by a lot of the health inequities that we had um, for COVID. I think it was one of those things where everyone was like surprised, but it was like, are you really surprised? Because these are all issues we had before the pandemic uh, began. And so it has so much to do with how uh, we move uh, in that space too. Uh, criminal justice is another, uh, a big issue for us. Um, we uh, have partnered with the uh, Office of um, Innovation, uh, as well as the uh, Office of Police Oversight that we have in the city. We produce an annual uh, report on racial profiling, um, which if you go back for the last five years, the racial profiling has actually gotten worse uh, in our city, uh, Black and Latino drivers are disproportionately stopped at higher rates. Uh, they're disproportionately searched at higher rates as, as well. And so we sort of see that play out in our law enforcement criminal justice system uh, as a city. Uh, and then I'll also add uh, on top of that is that we look at uh, other areas um, such as um, uh, around transportation is a, I think another sort of really big issue now uh, and the impact of things sort of like Project Connect, which is sort of uh, the upgrade in the public transportation system, um, uh, new rail lines that are coming in, and what type of impact will those have uh, on black and brown uh, communities and neighborhoods? Um, you know, we know that, that things like what they call transit-induced displacement, we have a lot of fancy names for stuff. But basically it means if you put in this really nice transportation, some gentrification displacement usually follows it and people get pushed out, right? 
So how do we prevent that uh, as, as one of the indicators is, uh, that we look at? Uh, and then the last one um, that is sort of really important for me is around homelessness. Uh, and um, this, you know, I, I think for me, when I first saw the data around homelessness, you know, my jaw dropped uh, around how disproportionate it is, which is 40% uh, of people that experience homelessness in our city are Black people, yet Black people only represent what seven, six to seven percent of the total population. So look at how overrepresented um, that is. And we really have to ask ourselves why. Um, and, and I fundamentally believe that uh, issues like that we can't solve or we can't tackle unless we really sort of step into this deeper discussion around the impact of racism uh, in our community and, and all the other work that we do that sort of feeds into that is going to be really be key to ending it. And so we see this across the board, but I think for me, the most eye-opening thing for me working at the city level um, is that the, the level of uh, of things that these racial sort of inequities live in, you know, uh, if I had to tell y'all one of the most sort of surprising or shocking areas is uh, even in pedestrian accidents. If you are a black person in Austin, you are more likely to be hit by a car. Well, I mean, wait, no, if you're Latino, you're more likely to be hit by a car in a pedestrian accident. If you're black, you're most likely for it to be fatal means you die from it right but if you think about it and you say even crossing the street has has racial disparities in it how do we get here but if you understand history design of neighborhoods communities who had access to, to, to sidewalks or not starts to kind of make sense to you of how it impacts it but yeah for me I was like when I first saw that data and got the briefing from our transportation team like even in crossing the street um, well, racism lives. So we're, we're uh, not here at the LBJ School, but we're talking, I guess, to an audience that's mostly uh, students and maybe maybe some faculty and, and staff from the LBJ School. LBJ School is a school of policy. It's a policy school. I think they give a degree in policy, et cetera. In the job that I currently occupy, I think um, David said it, I didn't mention it, um, but in that job, I'm a diversity officer, not an equity officer, which is an important difference. Um, but beyond that, in the current political in, uh, situation of uh, the state and the institution, diversity is mostly done through education, persuasion, um, trainings, you know, there's a lot of implicit bias training, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're trying to convince people to do what might be considered to be the right thing in relationship to equity. The LBJ school is supposed to be about policy. Um, at this point uh, in my job, uh, the kind of policy recommendations we make are not generally accepted because people in my institution are afraid of getting sued by the folks who have the upper hand in terms of the political and legal structure of the state. Um, but I don't know if that impacts what you all are able to do, but let me ask you this question. Beyond the training and the cultural change and the education and the persuasion and all those other kind of things that equity officers are asked to do, what would be the principal policy change that you would make at your institution that you think could address some of or even one of the problems of equity that you two both identify? And if you, if, you know, that, that is putting you on the spot. So if you if you choose to, no, I I'll take that one on um, before Brian makes me take it on first. But um, for me, hiring is crucial, and I think the policies around hiring have to change in, in the P three twelve system because 
at the end of the day, I can do lots of workshops on unconscious bias, and which our office doesn't do, by the way. We, we do a lot of stuff around structural change and looking at policy, but the people you hire, right? And even in my office, when we hire folks, we ask them, tell us about your cultural identity and your, your background and how that helps you connect with other people who don't share your background. And if somebody says, well, I don't really have a cult, you know, I'm next, it's, it's just next. And so we've been working on influencing policy in our district because of hiring. That's who's in front of the child. That's who's in front of Latino boys. That's who's in front of transgender students of any color. Um, speaking life into them, lifting them, recognizing their gifts and talents or not. And if you come to us in a certain way, we have to invest so much money, uh, dollars and time in trying to transform someone who's stuck in their lived experience. So for me, it is so important to make sure our, if, if I had to pick just, I mean, there's several others I would choose, but hiring, who's here, who's leading? And does that person come in understanding their power dynamic as a white person? Do you understand your positionality as a white person? Uh, that's what we mean by cultural proficiency in our organization. Do you understand your skin color, the privilege it affords you, uh, or do you not understand? Um, and does that person have an eye for the marginalized uh, groups, the groups that this, this organization has predictably marginalized? Uh, do they have that eye and that lens? And, do, and, and can they see racial constructs in a meeting? Can they see who holds power and who doesn't? Do they know when to step back? All of those things are really important. And we have to hire people who are on the journey because none of us is perfect. We're all on this journey, on a racial equity journey, if we choose to be, but we've got to hire people that are consciously on that journey in order to change the experiences our children have in the classroom and that our families have with teachers and with principals and, and so. I will just go with that one policy, but I could probably talk about this, about 10 other policies right now, but Brian, um, thoughts? Yeah, like I, I think we have to, we have to assess policy with the racial equity lens. Um, I oftentimes, I don't think we do enough due diligence around uh, examining policy because usually the way that things move forward is that somebody has an idea and they build a momentum of other people that like the idea. Um, but things that we don't do is that we don't, we don't logic model it. So are we really solving for the root cause of the problem that we're trying to address in the policy? Um, have we really examined who benefits and who's burdened? Um, have we actually sort of uh, disaggregated the data and broke it down by race to sort of identify um, uh, who needs who needs our resources or who who doesn't? Right? Um, Do we actually engage the community and are we co-creating? You know, with community of folks that are directly impacted to develop said policy, right? And so, if I had if I had to sort of wave my magic policy wand, it would be um, to actually develop policy um, through a racial equity lens and the process to actually develop and create that policy from the beginning. I think a lot of the stuff that we are trying to sort of work to undo um, is legacies of bad policy um, that in turn created bad culture and you spend a lot of time trying to unravel and undo that. And so uh, if there was a policy that you sort of say from this point forward, um, everything that we adopt, everything that we do is gonna be vetted in this way. I think it would kind of make a huge difference in our outcomes. I think it would make a huge difference in uh, our culture too. And, and you know, Dr. Gordon, I would also sort of say, I, I read a quote one time that said, Bad culture will eat good policy every day, all day. So it's not just about uh, it's not just about the policy piece. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, well-intentioned good policy uh, get ate up 
on the back end uh, with the administration and the implementation of said policy. And, and, you know, a lot of harmful things can be done on the back end of it too. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm an anthropologist and so I'm supposed to, I think, be someone who is attuned to culture and to the power of culture and to the unchanging nature of culture and all those kind of things. But I do find that trying to convince people to do the right thing uh, sometimes, uh, you know, can be pretty frustrating and oftentimes doesn't get you anywhere where uh, you know, trying to persuade people, I think, is a reasonable thing to do. But if you tell people that to do their job right, they got to do it in this kind of way, you can get some kickback and all that kind of thing. But if you back it up, then you have a good chance of actually having it done more or less the right way. And once people get into it and start doing it, then it can be followed up. But I'll, I'll take that point. I've got another um, question that kind of dovetails with this one. Uh, these LBJ folks are, are, you know, learning how to supposedly or already involved in sort of thinking through policy and policy decisions. But the other thing that I understand happens at the LBJ school is that they're uh, concerned with administration. Uh, how is it that you get complex institutions to, um, to operate in one way or another? Now, the two of you uh, occupy what I would consider to be, well, I'm in a similar situation myself, outsider positions in the institution in the sense that the things that we do are not crucial, or at least they're not understood to be crucial for the operation of the bureaucracy. In other words, if Ted Gordon uh, wasn't in the vice provost for diversity's position, the institution would operate, whereas if Ted Gordon as a faculty member wasn't teaching and nobody, none, none, none of the rest of us were teaching, then the institution would not operate. So in some sense, we're add-ons. And we're add-ons, I'll speak for myself, I'm an add-on who's trying to direct the bureaucracy, an institution that's operating in a, in a you know, with, with some uh, inertia, with some momentum. I'm trying to get that institution to change the direction of that momentum in certain crucial ways two problems with that. One is bureaucratic inertia. The other is that the institutions are formed uh, to the benefit of certain very powerful actors. How do you folks as diversity or equity administrators deal with both those problems? The bureaucratic inertia on the one hand and the political pressure that you get from folks who don't want the institution to change because the institution as currently constituted is working in their favor? That's the million dollar question, right? Um, my, uh, my husband of too many decades often says, why would an organization hire you to disrupt what's working for them? And we've had this conversation for years, right? And we know the various reasons. But one of the things that Brian hit on earlier has was incredibly helpful for me um, and helped me lean into this work late in my career. Um, but the whole idea of organizing. When I was at Austin Community College doing this work again in an inaugural uh, way, breaking ground, the power came in me organizing the faculty and staff. Um, and you know, you would have uh, tenured professors and custodians in the same meeting talking about racism and participating. And all these folks would uh, be nudging and pushing their departments, uh, asking questions. And one of the things we found that was powerful was giving people tools, decision-making tools, questions, heuristics, so they could think through a decision because we didn't want people to just come together and you know have la raza moments and yes and then go back out and then get squashed in their departments and so at atc we were able to build momentum because we brought people together regularly educated folks gave them tools and gave them somebody to talk to when they got the pushback in their departments and the same thing is uh, held true for and and we also did a lot of community organizing which is how i met brian 
um, and we were on the mayor's task force together. And so community building is the bedrock of keeping your sanity when you know that it's a David and Goliath situation. Also, and I often share with people the history, right? The Ida B. Wells and the, and the black men and women in the holes of, of uh, ships and enslaved Africans, uh, all of that thing, that, that's that psychological piece that an emotional piece that is so important to keep me going when I feel like I'm up against something. I think about the people who came before me and helped and handed me that baton. So I have to keep myself holistically, you know, spiritually, emotionally uh, connected. But the community is crucial at ASD internally and externally. We build community and we have people that call us. And I had one of those calls this morning that call us with the wind, you know their principal is going to do undoing racism and is going to participate in some training. And so we learn to count those wins, knowing that we're up against a system that is either consciously or unconsciously protecting white power. And people are either conscious or unconscious of it. And we feel like it's our job at every turn to disrupt it when we can, building relationships and bridges. Um, but it's community that keeps you sane, because if you try to take on these jobs as rugged individualists, right? Like I'm gonna put on my cape and I'm gonna make them, you know. Um, white supremacy waits for you to walk up the hill thinking you're gonna disrupt it. You will not do it alone and it will be difficult in community, but it's far better to get with colleagues who are like-minded and on the journey. Um, our, our team also, as I say, develops tools for people. If you look at our AISD uh, Equity Office website, you'll see Equity by Design, which is a model we put together based on work we've done with people in the region, equity decision-making tools. So I don't have to be in the room for you to do the right thing about black and brown kids I, uh, or black and brown staff. And so we develop tools and we, you know, we're happy to be in those conversations, but when we can't be, uh, we have community organizations that go on our website and they, uh, uh, under the equity office, you will see way, when you're talking about staffing for schools, we've set up a set of questions you can ask yourself. And so, you know, back to your question of how do you do this work? You do what you can knowing that, you know, the structure of the house is, is problematic. I often say that um, structural racism is like that, you know, uh, that beautiful house that everybody sees and that, oh, Austin is amazing, it's beautiful. And, and then you walk in and you see, oh my gosh, it's raining on the Latino children. Oh, there's no floor where the black people are. And, but from the curb, it looks glorious. And so what uh, organizations will do is they will build a patio and call it an equity office. And, or they'll build, you know, They'll put a, a, a nice uh, deck out back and they'll call it a diversity office. And then they'll just keep pointing to that thing, that equity office or the diversity office, uh, rather than deal with the fact that the very structure of the organization is broken, the foundation is broken. And so as equity officers, as diversity folk, our job is to continue to go inside the house talk to the people who are suffering inside the house and start the strategies of community building and, and, and doing the breakthrough work that has to be done. Ancestors did it, had it far worse than I do. Um, and so we, we, we keep all those things in mind. I'll speak for myself. I keep all those things in mind on those days where I'm most frustrated when I'm up against the most dense power sometimes. Um, and this can be demoralizing work as well, especially if you're trying to do it alone. It cannot be done alone. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, yeah, I think that's the toughest part of this job. Uh, you know, I was talking to my team actually um, last week, and we've been just, we said we've been going through a season of, uh, we sort of feel like defeat. And I had one teammate that she, you know, she said, we just need one win. Can we just get one, one win, you know? And sometimes you feel like that, right? Because, you know, to your, to your point, Dr. Gordon, yeah, the institution is not, um, it's, it likes what it produces. It's not necessarily invested in, in changing. And so we have a lot of conversations and a lot of strategy around power. 
Uh, we believe in working closely with community too. Um, and we really believe in uh, working with community to sort of help community be able to organize and see the power um, that they have. And, you know, for an example, um, I think I underestimated what it means to the community of some of the work that we can do as an equity office. So for example, um, we have the power to help inform the community about the process that the institution goes through. And that's so important because understanding and learning the process of something the institution is doing helps community see where you can intervene, right? Um, we help be able to educate the community and share information around the budget or the resources to a particular process, right? Uh, and if something bad is going to happen and you don't have the budget, then it won't happen, right? Or if you want something good to happen, it needs the the needs the budget, right? But this is sort of what you should, what you can advocate for, and what what you need. Um, we can also inform the community around the key role players within the particular policy or particular program. Sometimes community they don't even know who to call. Like you think about us, 14,000 employees and I'm dealing with this issue in my neighborhood, where do I even start, right? And so a lot of times we see ourselves uh, as being able to really support and even help you know where to start or to help you even build a relationship from the community perspective inside the institution. So we see ourselves a lot as like conveners uh, or connectors which sort of go um, I think a huge way, you know, and so we work a lot around, you know, different situations where we sort of say, okay, what kind of power do we have? Um, you know, we also use the power of our platform or our visibility to be able to elevate issues too. Uh, and we've seen that be successful for us uh, over, over the years. And so that's our relationship external with the community, but then also uh, we spend a lot of time on talking internally uh, to our staff about power. I think the most like fascinating thing for me when I started to work at the city of Austin um, was this, this notion for, for all of our, our bureaucrats who feel powerless. I would have so many meetings where, you know, staff would say, I, I feel powerless. I can't do anything about this or I can't do anything about that. And, you know, at first, you know, I say my first year, I kind of listened to that and I would entertain it. But at, but my second year, I stopped entertaining that because I, you know, I would say, wait a minute, we got a three, a three billion dollar budget, over 14,000 employees. And you saying like, we have no, you know, we have no power, we have no influence. We have a heavy footprint on this city. We have a heavy footprint on people's quality of life outcomes. And so we started having a lot more conversations internally about uh, recognizing your individual power. And, and you know, this whole concept of, you know, um, we send a lot of staff to undoing racism. So we're really rooted in this whole concept of gatekeeping. Um, which initially a lot of people sort of take a negative connotation to that. But gatekeeping means, you know, goes both ways. Um, you can open gates for good things. You can close gates uh, for bad things. And in every job that you have within an institution, there is power there. And that power can be used to help advance racial equity in some type of way. Doesn't matter what you do within the institution. So we talk a lot about getting people to really acknowledge and step into the power um, that they have within the institution. So a lot of times we ask people the question, um, what do you have the right to do? Um, what resources do you have control over? Um, what roles and positions in people do you, do you manage or, or direct, right? That's power in all of that. And part of it is that we sort of feel like if we can get everybody to step into the power and 
and open the gates in the right direction, it could really sort of lead to really big changes, right? But I think part of the, I think our society and our culture uh, interestingly conditions us to, to not want to acknowledge that we have the power, which I think is, is very interesting, especially for those of us that sit within the institution, you know, that have a lot of it. Um, but, you know, we do these workshops all the time. And every time we go around, uh, we sort of say, who has power? And you can say, you know, no hands go up, you know. And positionally, some of the most powerful people that we have. Right, we'll we'll sort of do that. So, David, uh, we're down to the last fifteen minutes. Do do you want uh, our panelists to uh, entertain some questions from the audience, or should I just go on interrogating them? Uh, I think I think uh, first, thank you all for just a really stimulating conversation, and for um, as Dr. Gordon was saying, you know, a lot of folks in the audience are practitioners, future administrators and bureaucrats, and just hearing your own position, your own thinking around these issues has been uh, invaluable uh, for our own training. Um, I, uh, I, I've got two questions in my pocket, and then uh, if, if we, that doesn't fill the time, we can, we can get to some more. Um, the first one is to, I think, uh, ask a question that's you know, there's a difference between diversity and equity. There's also a difference between policy and politics. And uh, Dr. Gordon, you spoke a little bit about the broader politics at the university, but um, uh, Mr. Oaks and Dr. Hawley, y'all are also dealing with elected councils. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship that you have with your elected bodies in terms of the work your institution, your administrative uh, bureaucratic institution is trying to accomplish, and then this elected body that's more responsive to voters uh, and has a different set of incentives. I mean, for me, in, in working with community, um, your ultimate power with community comes from the fact that um, these are elected positions. And so um, the mechanism to sort of hold your policymakers accountable, right, is is through that electoral process. Um, so I, I feel like for the community, um, definitely engaging your electeds, um, making sure that they understand, you know, the issues for your community is really important. Um, I think your work to really hold them accountable. Uh, in the policies that they decide and that they vote on, I think is a, is an important piece of that. Um, and so, and, and I feel like that's probably one of the most powerful pieces that that you have uh, in the system. I feel like our role uh, with electeds is to be able to inform them. Uh, a lot of time we see our role is also bringing a community voice, uh, especially for some, you know, we say more controversial issues uh, in which we're in relationship with the community, really bringing that voice uh, into that space um, so that they can have those discussions if they haven't uh, talked to, uh, to constituents and, and sort of hear and understand those issues as well. Uh, and then also I think uh, vice versa, there are some things that uh, we wanna do uh, that are more innovative and challenge the system uh, that we need their support on. So for example, uh, when the pandemic began, uh, our office actually for the first time for the city of Austin, we actually uh, were able to do direct cash assistance uh, for families that were experiencing economic hardship uh, for COVID. And that was unheard of for us as a city. Um, we got a lot of pushback uh, around um, putting sort of you know, money directly into people's hands. Other people wanted to do it where you, we're gonna pay for your bills for you, or we're gonna, you know, or we'll provide you sort of like, you know, uh, gift cards for food and different things like that. And we were really saying if people have cash, they can figure it out uh, and do it the best way possible. And I will tell you that internally, there were a lot uh, of, of rules and procedures um, that made that very difficult. But, it was our policymakers, our electeds that really sort of helped uh, set a priority to, for us to really be able to make that happen. 
So it goes that way too, uh, in terms of the relationship uh, with the elected body. And, you know, Dr. Holly, I'll pass it over to you. I'm gonna pass on that question. You and I have different lived experiences and different structures and constructs uh, that we work within. Um, and I'm going to pass on that one. I know you marked this day on the calendar, Brian. I didn't respond to a question. <laughs> that is just fine. Thank you, Dr. Holly. Um, uh, that sounds like the definition of politics. <laughs> um, we've got a question here uh, uh, about, you know, we're, we're a group that's talking about public and uh, sort of third sector politics, how do y'all think about engagement with the uh, private sector uh, within the city? Um, I'll, I'll leave that open-ended. So we approach this work um, by really trying to center the people that are most directly impacted. And nine times out of 10, that's probably not the private sector. And so for us, I will be honest to tell you that that is not necessarily a high priority for us. Um, we've taken on some issues where uh, the private sector is not aligned uh, with the work that, uh, that needs to be done. And, and I would say has actually proven to be problematic in a lot of areas for us. Um, so with our emphasis, uh, that's not necessarily the, the group that we're focused on hearing from you know, uh, first, uh, we really are focused on hearing from those that are most vulnerable. And those are the folks that we want to center in the work that we do. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Brian said. Um, our contact with privates has been short uh, because many times we're asked, we were asked early on to provide training. Uh, and we, you know, we are a, a pretty large school district and we don't have the bandwidth to provide, uh, you know, uh, training on racism and unconscious bias and all that for private sector folks. And even if they are partners who, you know, uh, contribute to scholarships and, you know, th those kinds of things. And so, um, as Brian said, most of our work is done with the people that our system has marginalized and, and is uh, not serving well. Can I add something to that? It, it takes your question or that question in a different direction. Um, one of the things that I think, having been on the school board, is an issue is that the school district, as a more socialized form of um, education, a public form of education, is continually impinged upon by the private sector. So the politics of the state are attempting to privatize education as much as possible as both through, through, through K through 12, as well as the university sector um, by reducing uh, government funding, but also by taking government funding and putting it into private hands. That's part of the, the issue that uh, Dr. Holly was talking about earlier was the charter school challenge, which is precisely that. So there's both a very robust private school operation in Austin that um, is the, one of the things we didn't talk too much about was the history of Austin, but that's the result of the, the desegregation of Austin schools produced a robust private uh, school sector. Uh, and now uh, the, push to aid charter schools and their competition with public schools is about that as well. So there's a, you know, it's one thing to be thinking about cooperation with the private sector, which is, I think, where the question came from, but it's another thing to see where, where things are at. You could say the same thing about the city. The city's ability to provide services is definitely impacted by some folks' ideological notion that those services are most efficiently uh, provided through private privatization of city services. So this is a, a back and forth that's definitely going on for those of us who are employees of the state or the city or 
whatever, uh, our positions are in direct opposition to where, in many cases, the private sector wants to drag things. And I'll say one more thing about that, which is close to my heart and has to do with AISD. AISD's divestment in terms of its divestment in school properties and in the closing of schools has everything to do with the real estate industry and the private sector and the value of, of, of land and housing in, in, in Austin. Uh, and people should, when we're thinking about these issues, people should be thinking about the private sector versus the public sector in terms of these processes. Thank you, Hi. Dr. Gordon. And I, you know, just would like to say to those of you who are trying to think about all the intricacies with politics, policy politics, you ask yourself one core question, who benefits? No matter what's going on in any of these systems, who, who's benefited and who is disenfranchised or displaced? And you ask yourself that, that's the very beginning of your equity work, right? Um, because there are a lot of phenomena that don't make sense. And usually if they don't make sense, <laughs> you start, start asking the questions and lifting the hood and you will in many times find pub, uh, private interest at the core. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. That's such a, a great place to take it. Um, in just in these last two minutes, I, I, there have been a couple questions on this and so, I'd love to hear you all speak very uh, briefly about how you uh, find joy and hope in this work in the face of the inequities you're facing and how you practice self-care. So I'm not very good at practicing self-care, but I'm trying to really get better at it. Um, yeah, I, I think that these jobs are hard. Uh, I'll tell y'all personally, that uh, from the start of the, the, the pandemic, I probably put on about 25 pounds uh, over those two years, um, had a lot of issues and challenges with uh, trying to control my blood pressure, um, had to be on two blood pressure medications. Um, and so it really sort of struck a change for me um, back in the fall uh, in which I'm really sort of working to, to you know, uh, they say better metabolize my trauma that I take on uh, with this job, but it is it is a work in progress for me. And um, yeah, and I think it's, it's real as a part of the job. I don't really think that I do it, um, you know, very well. And then what was the second part of the question? Uh, uh, finding joy. Oh, finding joy. So, I mean, yeah, I think finding joy for me is um, I'm starting to try to acknowledge uh, some of the, the smaller things. Um, I had a person that gave me a pep talk um, last week and she said, um, while you may not uh, get everything you want or change everything you want, um, understand that uh, you have planted seeds and your team is planting seeds all across you know the city and the city departments and she said um you may not see it but some of those those seeds are sprouting you know and she said that it may not be in you know in your generation or the next before they bloom um but you know be assured um that you know progress is being made um, and seeds have been planted. And that made me feel, that gave me a lot of joy to really hear that and to hear someone else acknowledge the work um, that we've done. And I mean, yeah, I think that, you know, when I look back at it, um, the fact that we were able to do the cash assistance during COVID has led us to being able to pilot our city's first guaranteed income program that we're going to do um, this year. So things build off of each other you know, each other when you look at it in perspective. And um, I'm getting the chance to work on a very exciting project with, with Dr. Gordon, which I hope that we're gonna be able to plant uh, some seeds to really bring me some joy too. So um, yeah, I think we gotta take more time to, to do that, that part of it. 
And sometimes you're so in the in the fight of everything, um, you don't really start to look up to to sort of think about um, the things that that you've been in. And take to take the time to really have some joy, uh, some joy in that. Yeah, Brian, all of all of what you said, right? It's like uh, you can get so intense and caught up and think that you're gonna, you know, you gotta solve this problem, and we don't. We just gotta run our leg of the race. And on on my better days, I think about what's my role, what's my part. What am I, and any time, and I give the advice to mentees all the time that when you feel burned out, that means you're trying to do that which you were not designed to do. And so I have to take that advice for myself. When I start to feel burned out, I'm, I'm reaching beyond my capacity and then to what end? And so it's, it's hard. It's a hard talks with yourself, but like Brian, I have several mentors in my world and, you know, one of my mentors told me, you have to remain indigestible to the system. And that is hard work to be within a system that's trying to metabolize you and, and trying to appropriate you so that it can continue, either consciously or unconsciously. And so remaining indigestible to the system and not getting appropriated and colonized uh, is sometimes the, the real work. The resistance internally in an organization can be what exhausts me and my team. And we always have to take a knee. We talk about this all the time. We have to take a knee. What can we do? What can we not do? And if one of us gets sick or, you know, have some physical ailment or whatever happens, how does that benefit children? And so we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day, and the joy I find is going to the school and seeing the kids and, and knowing that how frustrating it must be to be in fifth or sixth grade and you can't read. And that rolls me out of bed every morning. Like, how do we change a system and a culture? How do we support and move things? Because as frustrated as I am, I don't know what it's like not to be able to read. I don't know what it's like to be in the alternative learning center for two years. And so I find joy in going out and seeing what's working well in the system. And you know, you get, you get those sweet surprises from time to time and you're like, yes, let's get up. And then there are other times when you go out and you're like, I must, I, I have to continue. Because like Brian said in the beginning, we know, we know equity is at play when we can't predict by race who's going to be successful and who's going to fail, who the, I say, who the system is going to support and who the system is going to fail. And so, so there's joy. Um, I have the benefit of being around or have access to seeing hundreds, thousands of kids uh, on those days when these meetings will allow me to. So there's a lot of joy, but the joy also comes from community. Uh, I wouldn't be in this job without Brian Oaks. Um, He's, I mean, tough, tough early years, 2016, 2017. Um, it's the community among people that helps us too. So I just get joy being on, on a conversation like this because I promise you all the rest of my meetings have don't even <laughs> resemble what's going on here. And I thank you all for this opportunity today to listen, to learn, and, and to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you both. David, I'll let you close this down since it's 1.30 or yes. after 1.30. No, thank you everyone for uh, staying here. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to convene uh, you three, uh, your all important voices at your institutions in this city. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing these important learnings for us. Um, there are some great uh, links that we've put in the chat related to uh, the host today. Uh, the, some information about UNIDOS, our student group for Latinx students, uh, for the Center for the Study on Race and Democracy, and the Barbara Jordan National Forum. Um, but I'll leave it with that. Thank you all so much for your important work and for sharing with us today. And uh, we hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Mm -hmm.